Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's Bloom Impact Investing webinar on the topic of investing in sustainable energy storage and batteries. My name is Camille. I am the founder of Bloom Impact Investing and I will be your host today. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people as, as the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place today, which for me is Mia Jean, Brisbane. I recognize the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Turbul and Jagira nations. I pay deep respects to the elders past, present and future. Welcome again, it is a pleasure to see you all. For our new members today, please allow me to introduce Bloom and our Impact Investing Meetup Group. At Bloom, we are focusing on the impact money can have in the fight against climate change. We are on a mission to make impact investing and sustainable finance easy and accessible. Part of this mission is to offer educational opportunities like these webinars today. And we want to propel the voices of experts such as Dave and Stephen on the call today far and wide. The aim of our webinars is to build a community of impact investors and agents of change to build a greener, more circular and inclusive economy. At Rome, we also think that sustainable investing and sustainable finance should be accessible to everyone. And we see a future where a carbon-free and inclusive economy allows people and the planet to thrive. Now, quick housekeeping. Please note this event is being recorded and the webinar will be made available to all the attendees or anyone who has signed up on the Zoom webinar page after the event via email. Please also be aware that the information provided in this webinar will be general in nature only and does not constitute personal financial advice. Before acting on any information from this presentation, you should consider how appropriate the information is in regard to your objectives, financial situation and needs. Quick disclaimer, I have to. Finally, please note this is a safe space so you can ask any question throughout the event. Simply type in the chat if you would like me to ask, or at the end of the event, I can also unmute, um, welcome you to unmute yourself and you can ask our speakers directly. Now, allow me to introduce this webinar topic and our speakers. Today, we'll dive into a topic that is of the utmost importance for our clean energy transition, sustainable storage and batteries. Australia has obviously privileged access to low cost clean energy clean and renewable energy with enormous potential to capitalize on abundant solar and wind resources. But integrating this new clean energy into the electricity grid requires significant investment in the transmission and battery so storage systems to ensure the electricity grid remains stable. Furthermore, the global electrification of the the transport industry is quickly increasing the demand for systems, minerals, and equipment underpinning the energy storage and batteries. So as the result of both of these trends, battery storage has emerged as one of the most compelling investment opportunities in the clean energy infrastructure sector. But what opportunities exactly are, are there? How do we invest in these assets? Who are the leading players in big batteries, energy storage, hardware and software and minerals globally and here in Australia? What innovations and future trends are emerging? And how might we as impact investors invest in energy storage for profits, but also for impact? And to discuss this today, I have two fabulous speakers, which I will introduce shortly. Let's start with Dave. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Um, or I should say Dr. Dave West is the founder and CEO of BatNav. Um, Dave is passionate and optimistic about the future of energy and merging digital and AI technologies with engineering and business to benefit people and the planet. Drawing on, his, on this diverse set of skills and experience, and passion about making renewables work in the future, Dave founded BatNav. Am I pronouncing it right, BatNav? Perfect. BatNav provides engineering and project services to businesses for energy storage technologies using a future-proof business model. Partnering with experts, 
BATNAV automates the delivery of engineering expertise and makes it available on a scalable platform. We'll dive into it um, further down the track. Now allow me to introduce our second speaker, Stephen Panitza. Hi Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Stephen is a founding member of Federation. Previously, Stephen was the Chief Investment Risk Officer at the Clean Energy Finance Corporation of Australia. Prior to the CEFC, Stephen was a senior member of Macquarie Capital's Principal Investment Division and led that division in Asia. He has over 25 years experience in the financial services industry, including 15 years living and working in Asia. While Stephen's recent history has been dedicated to clean energy and renewables financing, his detailed prior experience across infrastructure, resources, industrials, services, and other sectors often proves useful to invest, com to invest in companies as they look to contract with government and other businesses. Um, I believe, Stephen, you are also in charge of renewables at, at Federation. That's um, correct. So you have a really deep understanding of, of, this, um, of this topic. Thank you so much for making the time to join us today. It's my pleasure. Now, without further ado, um, let's dive into it. And my first question to, to open up the panel discussion today um, is quite broad. Um, can you both in, unpack the sustainable storage and battery space? What key activities and solutions exist today? Dave, would you like to start? Thank you, Stephen. I wasn't sure who was going to go first, so I'm glad you jumped in there. So it's an interesting question, and I noticed um, in, in the way you worded it is, is around sustainability, and there's a couple of aspects to sustainability in terms of energy storage, and one of those is like the physical sustainability of the minerals and the materials and everything that we need to use to actually um, create energy storage technologies and then um, dispose of them and, and create a circular economy around that. And there's also the economic sustainability, which is another big, big factor as well, because um, there's a lot of challenges uh, in terms of the business case around energy storage technologies. And you'll, you'll, sh I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss today some of the, the challenges around business case. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very big area. And if we look at predictions for what IRENA and IEA have around solar and wind generation over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, we're going to see increasing penetrations of those technologies and we know that they're variable. So there's um, a, a lot of opportunity. Um, we've, in Australia, we've, we've sort of got our eyes open to that opportunity before I think the rest of the world with the Tesla big battery. It really sort of gave us an opportunity to think about what was possible in terms of power systems and the power grid. Um, but lithium ion batteries won't be the only solution. There's, there's other technologies that we need to consider and, and ensuring that each of those technologies find a market is really important. Thank you, Dave. Stephen, do you wish to? Um, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and I wanna talk broadly about storage and sustainability. Um, and, and then we'll focus in on, uh, in particular, battery storage as we progress. Um, so storage in and of itself is not sustainable energy. Uh, it depends on what you use to create, you know, to charge that storage, be it, you know, chemical, mechanical, or whatever form the storage takes. So, for example, um, the pumped hydro in, um, in the snowy at the moment is used and has historically been used by pumping water up the hill using uh, energy generated predominantly in the uh, lignite or uh, brown coal fired um, uh, Victorian electricity system. That, that is not sustainable energy. It's actually using, um, you know, using uh, highly polluting energy to charge it. So when we talk about storage, we need to think about storage in the context of the ecosystem of decarbonizing generation. Uh, and I think I think that's the way that we uh, that we think about it. It's not it's not enough just to bring storage. You need to uh, use that storage to uh, enable the the penetration of renewables to go up in 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 the national electricity market, and accordingly the um, the emissions intensity uh, to go down. Um, we're going to talk predominantly about batteries today, but. But as um, Dr. West just mentioned, there are many uh, storage technologies. Uh, and I see actually that each of them has its place in that entire 
ecosystem. So for the shorter, you know, uh, at the moment, economically, we're constrained to, you know, two hours of storage with, with lithium ion. I hope to see that in the next five years be, you know, six to, six to eight hours being, being economic. That's one role. Uh, Snowy two, then um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 168 hours of long duration storage. That's another, you know, that, that fulfills another purpose. So I think where we need to, the, the first step is this decarbonisation process. And the second step is um, uh, inducing investment in storage right across that spectrum of, you know, shorter term to, uh, to very long dated, uh, very uh, long duration uh, storage capacity. Thank you. That's a great overview for our attendees today. Um, with, with all this in mind, uh, I'd love to transition the discussion around the investment landscape. So um, it's obviously wide and varied, but can you unpack for us the key opportunities to invest in this sector? And also, um, what is um, needing the most investment? I think you should take that one, Stephen, first. Okay. Yes. Um, allow me to start with that and I'll just have a few notes. Um, I, I think you need to look at you know, battery storage in particular has a, has a very wide, uh, they're very flexible, it has a very wide um, range of applications um, that they can be uh, put to. So um, in front of the meter applications, behind the meter applications, um, in some markets, um, displaced grid spending. Um, and as we become more and more sophisticated, um, products like uh, virtual inertia um, as well. So um, I, I can get to a little bit more detail later on in the investment case um, for, for each of those, but it is going to be driven by what that application is. Now, if we look at, well, what are batteries being used for in the NEM today? Um, they're, they're effectively being used to, at its core, to shift um, generation from a, from a low demand period to a high demand period um, and to provide um, so-called FCAS services, frequency control and ancillary services, um, uh, at which they are very, very, um, uh, you know, very, very effective in, in, in being able to deliver those services. And that, that, I think, is one of the key takeaways from the, the Hornsdale big battery that, um, that they've just owned the FCAS market. I'm exaggerating slightly, but, um, you know, uh, uh, they're a very, very flexible uh, instrument and will play myriad roles um, right throughout the grid. Thank you, Stephen. Dave, would you like to, I guess, answer that question, but from the battery perspective, where can you describe for us the investment landscape? Yeah, ba battery and energy storage technologies in general. So, so you know, with Batna, we talk about batteries, but we see energy storage technologies as batteries. It's like a, just just one sort of like a common term for it. So, globally, there's there's heaps happening, um, and a lot of big venture capital companies are trying to pick winners. So, we've seen investments um, of 500 million US dollars in quantum scape. North Vault raised 600 million US dollars. Sala Nano raised 590 million dollars. Um, Energy Nest, which is a thermal battery startup, so not lithium ion, it's a totally different technology altogether, raised 130 million dollars. Um, uh, a battery recycling company, I'm not sure if I can share the details of it, um, are doing a scale up plant in Nevada and they raised over 100 million dollars. Oh, no, 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 four million dollars. So is, that, is that all in the US? That's that's in US dollars. North Vault, North Vault is based in Sweden, um, or it might be Norway. It's, it's Scandinavia, uh, but mostly in the US. But so there's a lot of in Silicon Valley. There is a whole sort of hub of battery startups, um, all, all trying to to generate the next best best thing, and, and mostly around solid state batteries as well, which is seen as the natural evolution of lithium ion batteries that has a lot of benefits in terms of um, the number of cycles, the rate of charge and discharge, flammability issues are resolved, but it's technically very difficult. So, um, you know, I have a PhD in materials engineering and I worked in materials science for many years before I did that. It takes a long time to actually deliver results in materials engineering. You, can, you can't change the laws of physics and when you're working at the atomic level, 
um, those little atoms don't behave themselves and they, they don't go in the places that you want them to go. So there's a lot of big money being thrown around to try and pick winners. Um, that's the first thing. And you, and you could follow that if you want to believe um, what is being reported out of those companies. So that's one option in terms of investment. Other types of investments are companies working in, um, and you mentioned it before, Camilla, around, around the software, sort of control technology of, of charge discharge dis decisions and, and operating in, in um, a marketplace. So there's a company in the UK called Habitat Energy that focus on this, but they're also in that space where Tesla and Fluence are already operating in that space, have far more data, have far more resources. It's going to be very challenging for habitat to be able to compete with those big players they might they might have their space but there's, there's that opportunity as well you obviously have your vendors like um, the big ones tesla and fluence but from an investment point of view they're large companies and they're not just solely energy storage but obviously they're, they're big in that big in that space so fluence is a joint venture between siemens and ams i think it is or aes so big backers and and that's why they do quite well they've had heavy investment from from siemens the other investment opportunities which um, are pretty important for Australia are around critical minerals. So we have actively some of the biggest battery material companies in the world in Australia now securing up supply chains for battery materials. So these are companies that, that will uh, supply their cathode active material into Samsung, SDI, Panasonic, Tesla, Northvolt, so really premium type materials. And that security of the supply chain is, is a really important factor for um, electric vehicles and using lithium ion batteries for energy storage in the future. So that's a, another opportunity, but I think that horse is probably bolted. We're already seeing reports of super cycles in minerals and things like that, but um, you never know what the next lithium ion chemistry is going to be. You know, Tesla came out last year announcing a totally different um, combination of nickel, manganese, cobalt for the next phase of battery to manage those, those uh, supply chain issues. And then around it, you've got energy storage services as, as a way to invest in and get involved. So there's a company called Novonics in the US. They're, they're actually listed in Australia, um, but they have a Canadian development lab and they also have a graphite mine in the US. So again, it's a little bit blended, but they're not trying to pick winners either. They just they, they talk about actually just developing better and better batteries, right? So just do, doing what we have and just make it better and better. Um, make sure that we make the batteries last longer. They continue to perform over their life. And then the other alternative is companies like Batnav where uh, we don't pick winners either. We actually look at all of the energy storage technologies. We can see the risks of all of them. We believe that every energy storage technology has its application. And we want to make sure that we find that application and, and make the market work efficiently. So there's, there's the materials companies, there's the control companies, there's vendors, minerals, and then services around the whole energy storage industry. Thank you so much. Fantastic overview. Um, and and I, I feel like there's a lot of competition um, globally. Can you quickly tell us your thoughts on um, Australia and where, where do you see us um, competing? Ooh. Well, minerals, obviously, we're going, going to do well at. That's what, we, that's what we do well. But I think there's also a good opportunity for us to look at advantages of doing a lot more of the mineral processing onshore. Um, there, there's a lot of risks in the supply chain for minerals. Uh, so the easy to find, easy to process, easy to transport minerals have already been found. And the future will be the hard to find, hard to process, hard to transport materials. Now, some of the some of the key components for the battery materials have issues with transportation, as in you can't you can't move them in, um, onto and off of a ship easily. They will actually settle and change uh, structure in that transportation process just with time. So that means bringing more of the mineral minerals processing back on shore which we can do. We have excellent skills in that area already in Australia. And if we're going to transition away from coal, we're going to have a whole bunch of chemical and minerals processing engineers with that ability and a, a huge opportunity to do it there. Plus, as you said earlier, we have abundant sunshine and pretty good wind resources. So we have a lot of onshore energy available that will be relatively low cost to do that. So that's a, a big opportunity there. There's also other stuff here in Queensland as well as um, we have a couple of companies exploring um, vanadium deposits here in Queensland. So vanadium is uh, a critical mineral for vanadium flow batteries. So it has its place in the energy storage industry. Um, it does some things that lithium ion doesn't do. It has some 
um, downsides compared to lithium ion, but it will have its place in the future as well. So that's that area that's developing as well. Um, uh, yeah, I could talk for hours, but that's probably Thank enough. You, that's a great <laughs> And uh, a lot of opportunities here in Australia and a lot of knowledge on minerals, like you said. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Dave. Um, you are a great example of someone that worked in the storage industry, um, I guess, jumped from the academia to the entrepreneurial arena. Um, and you turned, um, you turned all this, all your knowledge into um, an innovative and scalable business. Can you tell our audience a little bit more about what exactly is BATNAV? Um, yeah, tell, tell us more. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, I started BATNAV um, back, uh, it was several years ago, but really launched it seriously at the end of last year. Um, what we provide is services, particularly engineering procurement services for the energy storage industry. So in between academia and where I am now, I spent most of my career working for Origin Energy and, and big gas projects, right? So I'm, I'm not, not as green as, as I'd like to feel, but at the same time, 10 years ago, I, I stood up in front of the Australian Pipeline and Gas Association and told them that gas was the transition fuel to, to, uh, to um, a renewable future. And I didn't, I didn't get applause for that uh, comment, that's for sure. But um, this has been a trajectory I've been on for a long time. And so what BATNAV does is we provide the knowledge and information that businesses need to understand the risks for energy storage technologies. And then we provide the engineering services and procurement around that to help them um, manage that risk. So um, energy storage is not cheap. And that's one of the reasons it's really controversial. If it was cheap, we'd install it and nobody would be arguing about it. Um, but it is expensive. And there are a lot of numerous technologies and it's very hard to make that decision. So working um, for Origin and on big projects, I was working on buying um, very large quantities of steel in the order of like $350 million procurement decisions. Going through that process, you had to have very, very high levels of due diligence to be able to make those decisions. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of approach we've taken with BATNA with our first product cell engineer for utilities. Um, but we realized that what we were actually delivering is expertise and expertise that was scarce and scaling that in a way so that people who didn't know where to find it or couldn't find it locally, um, they could access it. And that's, the, that's what we're seeing with energy storage because it's emerging so quickly and growing so quickly. And there's so many different technologies and those technologies have risks. As an engineer and myself working in that environment, you are tasked with getting a really good price on the asset, justifying its value to shareholders via the, the board, board that you are uh, pre presenting your decision to, and then managing the risks to make sure that when you put it into operation, it will do what you expect it to do and live out its design life so that it returns the economic benefit that was originally in the business case. So that's really what we, we do. We help de-risk procurement um, and help businesses get the, the value from the asset that they expect to get. Thank you, Dave. That's a great, um, great overview of your of your business, and obviously you have a lot of experience to uh, dive into this this space. Um, I'm going to go to Stephen next. Um, I would love to understand from your perspective, Stephen, and your work at um, Federation, where you look at um, renewables as a whole. Can you tell us more about what opportunities um, you are looking at at the moment? Investment. Okay. I mean. Of course. Uh, I'd just like to add briefly to some of the comments that David made earlier about investment opportunity or activity uh, uh, in Australia. So I'm in Perth, 200k south of here is the world's largest hard rock lithium mine, green bushes. Um, and whereas historically we would just dig that up and export it as, as spodumene, um, 6 to 8%, I think, lithium. Um, there's a lot of investment taking place with lithium hydroxide plants being built um, just down in uh, south of here in, in, in Kwinana and, um, uh, and in Bunbury. So that's actually then taking it to uh, 19, I want to say four nines, I may be wrong on that, but, but basically um, uh, in, in a state that's ready to incorporate straight, straight into batteries. And I think if you look at the history of renewables, uh, sorry, the history of resource investment in Australia, we haven't always done that. It's usually taken out in its, in its simplest form. Uh, that's one comment. 
The second comment I would make is for all of the investment opportunity around, um, uh, around you know, um, decarbonisation of the economy, the one I like is, uh, is the very unsexy copper. Um, particularly if you're looking at electrification of transport, um, there's a lot of demand, uh, increased demand for copper coming and a lot of the very large copper mines, Escondida and, and, uh, and the like, are actually coming to the end of their lives. So I think that, um, that, that copper has a bright future, if, if you'll excuse the pun. And now there's one final comment I would make is, um, uh, is there is a little Australian business. Uh, all of this VC type investment is taking place in, in the Valley, but, um, or most of it. But there's a little company in Melbourne called Relectrify, some of you may have heard of, and they're doing a really important job because they are taking um, used um, uh, lithium ion batteries from very high uh, demand applications like vehicular transport and repurposing them for other applications. And we need to, as we talk, think about battery storage and, and um, decarbonisation, we need to think about the whole cycle and what happens to those batteries. We, we don't just want to create another waste problem uh, in future. So that um, just coming back now to your, your question about federation. Um, federation's a, 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 an alternative asset manager. Um, we, you know, I'm responsible for renewables um, or what we call sustainable infrastructure. Um, we have a, a growth capital strategy and then we do social infrastructure as well. We build housing for Australians living with disabilities. Um, so on my side, I've established a fund um, called the Sustainable Australian Real Asset Fund. Um, we're not marketing geniuses at, uh, at Federation, so that's the best we could come up with, uh, Sarah. Um, and that fund has been anchored by a group out of the US called Grosvenor Capital Management, um, who we found were very attuned to um, uh, renewables and the need to transition the economy and wanted to partner with us in, in, in the Australian market. Um, as I look at the opportunity set, that's an institutional fund. We're looking to raise about a billion dollars. The opportunity set that I look at there is um, initially for the next three to five years, it's going to be predominantly wind in Australia. Um, and, and that is because of the extreme correlation of solar on the, on, the, um, uh, on the East Coast or the national electricity market. And wind is much less correlated, which, which gives advantage in terms of grid, in terms of the time of day, the dispatch weight of pricing uh, and the like. Once we see storage coming down the cost curve uh, and, and solar continues to come down the cost curve, once that gets, I'm, I'm gonna make it up and say $100 or in that area, I think it then all swings back to combination of solar and batteries. So uh, shorter term, immediate priorities, wind, um, then opportunistically solar, um, but batteries is um, just absolutely core to Sarah's uh, Sarah's strategy. So we're spending a lot of time trying to get in front of the, the, the wave of investment um, that, that's coming through batteries. Uh, longer term, I'm very interested in or sort of medium term, say five years, very, very interested in looking at the combination of um, ultra low cost behind the meter generation with very energy consumptive um, um, infrastructure. So for example, water desalination and filtration. Uh, combined with behind the meter generation or um, um, or digital infrastructure is a, a, another example. Um, I also like behind the meter solar applications. So working to put batteries and uh, generation on yeah, uh, commercial and industrial size um, loads um, and, and applications. So that's the, that's the spectrum. So wind first, batteries, and then batteries and solar, and then the broader infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it sounds like um, you, yeah, you have a holistic approach of um, renewables at Federation and it's good to see that you're collaborating with um, um, global partners to bring capital in Australia. That's, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm going to go back to Dave, um, if you don't mind, to talk about um, market size and opportunity in the big bat battery space. Do you have figures um, in mind to you know, share with the audience so we, we can have an idea about how big the opportunity is? Yeah, um, yeah. analysts always use different assumptions. So you can report numbers that, and, and often they, they sound very contradictory. Um, but at the moment, the estimates sort of an energy storage market value 
in the research that we've done is about uh, in 2020 it was about us five billion dollars with an expectation it'll grow to 11 billion dollars by 2025 um, and then batteries so if you look at lithium-ion batteries as a component of that um, it could could be you know maybe maybe 50 percent or more that's sort of the whole energy storage market and then commercial and industrial is a, is a sub market of that and again the numbers are quite similar so you know looking at what the analysts present they're, they're almost contradictory but whatever numbers you cut if you work from first principles the number is very large right so if we're going to increase from 20,000 terawatt hours in 2020 to you know extrapolate out to 32,000 terawatt hours by 2030 and we're going to go from five percent solar and wind to sort of 15 or 20 or 25 percent by that time it starts to become a very large gap into when you produce electricity as to when you consume electricity and in interconnectors fill that spot for sure you can move electricity around but it's still uncertain so there's a large percentage of storage that's needed yeah i talk about energy as like being you know, the biggest industry in the world we take so much for granted that when we plug our fridge in or we turn our washing machine on it just works our whole the whole modern world and even not even the modern world you know china runs on electricity and when we don't have it it becomes a massive problem so we have to fill that gap and it will increasingly become a problem because in queensland we saw um, two weeks ago calide sea coal-fired power plant went down um lots of debate about what would have you know, fix that that outage would have been batteries, was it something else? It, it doesn't really matter, but we can see as the energy transition happens, there's gonna be more and more instability, there's gonna be more and more variation and we're gonna need buffers and we're gonna need storage. Um, you know, so Wood Mackenzie is a, a pretty good source for, for this area. They provide reasonably good information, I find. Um, they reported 2013 to 2018 energy storage cap install capacity doubled every year for five years and they expect that going forward to 2030 it will increase 30 percent year on year so and that's just a 2030 and then as we go now that we've got some serious commitments to net zero 2050 and a hard end to it we're going to see those numbers you know either sustain or possibly increase as you get beyond 2030 as people you know have to accelerate towards the, the finish line so very very big numbers um, yeah it's, it's yeah. huge we can we can uh, see clearly that storage can quickly become that bottleneck right that could lock our progress with um totally. and then and then you go back and then it's not just batteries it could be the crit critical minerals and so the price of critical minerals increases which then makes the price of a lithium-ion battery increases which means then you have to consider uh, a closed circuit hydrogen or a flow battery or whatever other technology comes through. So the, the economics around energy storage are really fascinating. And I'm, oh, it's, it's so complex. It's um, which, which actually brings me to um, my next question. It's the perfect segue. And it's, um, I'm going to ask both of you, for investors new to this area, so our audience today, um, although they might be already experienced, but let's, let's assume that we're all new to this space. What are your tips on how to invest smartly in the storage space? How can we assess good opportunity? Should we look at regulations, supply chain, technology, legislation? Tell us, tell us your view. You go first, Stephen. Okay. Um, the, the, I think when it comes to the fundamentals um, of investment, you need to look at where storage is particularly battery storage is in the development cycle of the product. Uh, it's still an early stage. I'm an infrastructure investor, so I'm investing in, um, you know, very long dated assets, um, very stable cash flows. Uh, and, and we haven't quite got there yet with batteries. Um, we're incorporating batteries and in, using them in certain applications, but the opportunity to invest in a battery in an infrastructure sense is, is very, very limited at the moment, maybe a bit behind the meter, but, but quite limited. So where the investment opportunity for batteries uh, sits at the moment is in venture capital, um, I think, or, or growth capital in some of the, the, the concerns that are there. Um, now, venture capital uh, investing is not easy. In fact, it's notoriously hard. Um, but, but I would be thinking to, you know, I would be thinking to the, the long game uh, in making investments. So, um, you know, doing your uh, research fundamentally, selecting situations where you can see the commercial application in a, 
you know, three to five year time frame, or, or possibly even a little bit longer. Uh, and then not, you know, not betting, right? Not not sort of trying to pick a winner. But if if you do want to support and invest in the space, investing in venture capital, you know, modest uh, investments placed in in areas that you um, that you can see would would develop would be uh, would be my advice. For a more, uh, again, for coming back to um, Dr. West's comments earlier, for a more traditional approach to investing, um, the materials companies. Um, you know, we have good materials companies here in Australia, and you know, obviously, a very stable investment environment. So you could play the, um, you know, the, the adoption of storage through that that means as well. Dave. Uh, yeah, there's uh, you can you can follow those paths. I think uh, we talked about critical minerals before. Uh, I think that horse is probably already bolded. Um, but recycling technology is going to be a big one as well. That's definitely going to grow. And there's there's um, you know, companies doing pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy trying to work out how to crack that code and, and recycle those critical minerals because as demand increases for them, the price um, of getting the raw materials out of the ground, the recycling stream will become um, uh, more and more profitable. So that's uh, an area to, to look out for. It's hard to really, it's hard to know how that, that technology is going to work because battery materials for, particularly for lithium ion batteries are highly controlled, highly precise materials. And when you recycle things or you, you're reclaiming them, you have less control over achieving the highly precise requirements that you get for high performance lithium ion batteries. So um, whoever can 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 win that race will do really really well for sure. Um, but it's it's really hard. So and and that's uh, part of the philosophy behind Batnav is we don't pick winners. We know it's going to be really hard. The economics is going to change everything. It's not just going to be about technology. It's going to be about supply chains and it's going to be about um, the demand for energy storage to to make sure we have secure and reliable electricity is going to mean that. We're going to have to take whatever's available and make sure it fits into the right applications. That's that's what we firmly believe. Mm, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I have two two more questions on that um, investment piece. So, um, Stephen, you you mentioned that maybe for battery and storage, we are still in that early stage VC funding um, cycle. Do you see gaps in the market in terms of funding? Do we need more government funding? Do we need more private capital? Do we need more um, R&D support for our universities? Um, what, are, what, are the, what are the gaps? Camille, I think it's really, really easy. We just need proper regulation. Uh, if you create a regulatory environment that enables us to invest, um, there's, there's oceans of capital out there at the moment that want to typically sort of infrastructure style investment that wants to invest in sustainability. Um, but, you know, with um, it, it's challenging enough in the Australian electricity market uh, with making 25 year, 30 year investments when you have, you know, government policy changing, you know, random gas fired you know, generation being built here and there. Um, that that makes it very difficult. So the right framework and, and, and being a little bit more specific about that, uh, perhaps a capacity market. Uh, a capacity market can have its own problems. Um, we don't have one in, in the national electricity market. Um, there is one here in Western Australia, um, but uh, in, in, in a limited way. I think that capacity market would, um, uh, would change things uh, immensely. Um, th there's one stat that I want to come back to uh, or, or that, um, that one of our investing companies, Windlab, did a study of how much storage you would need in, in whatever form, be it lithium ion or, or, um, you know, or, 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 or mechanical storage, uh, to get to somewhere near 70% renewable penetration. Uh, and actually, whilst it's a large number, it's not that large at all. So I think if I'm recalling it correctly, they're saying that to get to around that 70% in the national electricity market, we'd need about 24 gigawatts of storage or 81 gigawatt hours of storage. Um, that now I may, you know, I may be uh, misquoting that, but um, uh, that that tells you that that um, that you know bringing that opportunity, uh, bringing that capacity in is um, 
uh, is, is challenging in, in its own right. Um, and the way to facilitate or accelerate that is just have a, a stable, um, you know, well-considered energy policy. I, I don't think it even really needs subsidies. It just needs a recognition that there is value in dispatchability. Mm, yeah, regulations, often the key in so many clean tech sectors. Mm. But I think at the I think at the earlier end in, in, in the VC, um, you know, that is happening. I, I would like to see the universities uh, better funded on the on the research end. I think we're very good at that, and we, we tend to export our expertise um, until they've sort of had their careers and want to come <laughs> come home again. It'd be nice to see a lot more of that um, happening here in Australia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take the conversation. We have um, probably enough time for one or two more questions, and then I'll open up the conversation to the attendees. There's already a few questions in the chat. Um, I'd love to um, drive the conversation towards the impact piece. So can you tell us more about what impact uh, we can have in terms of decarbonizing the industry when we invest in um, storage and batteries? I'd probably answer that from a self-serving <laughs> viewpoint. So I might let Stephen answer that one. Well, I'm, I'm probably equally as self-serving, but um, uh, Camille, I have been, I set up my own, this business federation with some, uh, some partners, what, two and a half years ago. Uh, and I have found that the, you know, Every time there's an event in Australia, the, the amount of reverse inquiry, as we call it, for sustainable investment or impact investing, which is, which is what we do, increases. So it was the bushfires. Um, and, you know, we have a retail product that's sort of down to $20,000 investments. We have people from, have had in, their entire career in the coal industry or the mining industry or resource industries um, that want to invest to, to have an impact for their grandchildren. So be it bushfires, be it the drought, uh, and particularly COVID, um, you know, there's just this groundswell coming from, uh, you know, from, from retail investors that, um, that want to use their, you know, their capital and frankly, the power that comes with that uh, to change the way we do things. There are a lot of, you know, the, the business absolutely gets it. So, you know, the, the, the change to, yeah, the, the evolution, and, and it's not a revolution, it's evolution uh, in the energy market in Australia is, is going to happen, you know, it, it's inevitable, it's happening. And it's, it's not, you know, I explain this to overseas visitors all the time, it's not a, a top-down thing. We don't have a feed-in tariff. We don't have government policies that say you, you shall and must do that, but we're going to do it anyway. And we're going to do it in a, lead, in a way in which we lead. And that's because it's the it's coming from the people. So we'll do it despite the government, not because of the government. I love that people power. Dave, what, what do you think? Yeah, so the impact from 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 Bad Nose's perspective is really um, we've talked about it before numerous emerging technologies. It's really hard to make a decision. I've been on projects having to make that decision and having to justify decisions about energy storage where you've got to manage risk. You've got to, got to convince people that you're getting good money for money for value, good value for money. Um, and it's really hard with emerging technologies that are highly technical, really, really technical. Like um, finding expertise to answer the questions and make sure that you are getting good value for money is, is just, just not easy. So you end up with a huge asymmetry in the information between the buyer and the seller. And so the problem with that is, is that this, the buyer then has to price in the risk of getting the wrong energy storage or the energy storage that doesn't perform. So they're actually willing to pay less for the premium product than they should pay. And they pay more for the sub premium product than what they should pay. So it's a really inefficient market. And that's what we're, we're, we're doing. We're balancing that information asymmetry to make sure that people can manage their risk and that people get the right battery at the right price. And that should benefit both sellers and buyers. It's a much more efficient market. So that's the impact that we have. And then by doing that, by making the energy storage procurement asset um, market work more efficiently, that means that it will support solar and wind, which means we have greater penetration of solar and wind. That's the argument that we have. Yeah, 
huge, huge potential for impact. Um, we're reaching the end of my questions and I'm gonna share, um, I'm gonna let the audience ask a few questions to you um, guys. So uh, we had a question from Mark. Um, Mark, feel free to unmute yourself if you can, otherwise I can ask on your behalf. Mark had a question about investing in early stage. I might ask on his behalf um, if, if that's okay. So Mark asked, who is investing in early stage battery tech in Australia at the moment? Are we condemned to simply see the all too typical brain drain as our talented research scientists and engineers get picked up to head overseas where an early stage venture business is far more likely to receive invest um, pre MVP stage? So going back to that VC uh, question, and, and maybe there's more support, more risk appetite overseas. Yeah. Um, well, Mark, I wish I could say I had a had an answer that was more positive, um, but it, it is it is a very limited market here in Australia, the the venture capital market. There, there are situations where um, uh, where you know we are. I mentioned Relectrify. Uh, we are seeing um, VCs working on on, on certain strategies, um, but I'll, I'll defer to Dr. West on this. But the investment required uh, and the you know um, extreme knowledge um, and, and and depth of science and chemistry required to understand uh, battery investment, combined with the dollars, means that it's going to go to places like the Valley or 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 the European markets. I think that's just inevitability um, where you know where where can we uh, where can we help I think we can be smart about applications um, we, you know situations in which we novel situations in which we might be able to use this technology um, to advantage uh, ourselves here in Australia but uh, I think you're going to find most of the venture capital is going to be abroad yeah, definitely a broad high risk appetite and just a different research um, research industry. In the northern hemisphere, so the US and Europe, the research industry is so large and developed that you actually have research contractors as well, which is, is just a totally different different world. In Australia, we we sort of stuck, we have we try and do good industry university collaboration. But though the two institutions have totally different timeframes and mindsets and objectives, and it doesn't work very well. We do have um, some government money going into uh, the future battery industry CRC when they're doing some good work. Um, but it is inevitable that the, the most talented materials scientists and engineers will end up overseas. And it's very hard to actually stop that from a, a policy point of view because uh, most of the batteries will be fed into electric vehicles and electric vehicle and automotive companies like to have their supply chains really, really close. So having them close by to where they're actually manufacturing um, automobiles is, is something that's always going to pull that, that technology or those companies and the talent that's needed for those companies to those locations. Um, we need to focus on what we do well and do as much mineral processing here as we can. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always going to be a challenge to compete with the Northern Hemisphere. Thank you both. Uh, the next question comes from Alexander. Alexander, if you can unmute yourself. Sure. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask um, with the cell engineer service, whether that works for small batteries as well, like a, um, a business that has one or 200 uh, kilowatts of solar on the roof to then work out what size battery would help them um, bring their costs down. Jeez, I, I, and I didn't even pay you to ask that question. Oh, <laughs> so cell engineer for commercial and industrial will, will actually have three main features. The first feature will be a battery sizing tool. So, and it'll be for um, anything from a 250 kilowatt hour up to about a five megawatt hour battery. So, so still pretty big batteries. And, and think of the companies as, um, uh, so one example is from our crowdfunding, we've not just got investors, but we've also got customers and some of those potential customers. One example is uh, uh, as an electrician who installed a hundred kilowatt solar development for a vineyard. And you go, well, what does a vineyard need solar for? They need it for irrigation. They're running a 55 kilowatt pump. 
and they get slugged with massive penalty tariffs if they use too much power at different times of the day. So this particular development was, developer was saying a 250 kilowatt hour battery would be perfect for them to be able to run their, their pump outside of um, times when they, they are not generating electricity. And the question then becomes, okay, so I'm pretty sure it's a good business case as a commercial operation to get a battery, what size battery do I need? And it depends on, on, on the load profile that you expect to have. Um, fortunately, a, a lot of smart people have thought about that previously and there's big databases on what load profiles are for commercial industrial um, uh, applications. And it depends on what your generation capacity is, what your tariffs are. So the first product or the first feature in the cell engineer for commercial industrial product will be about around a battery sizing tool. So we'll, we'll help you as a someone that has a 100 or a 200 kilowatt um, rooftop solar system or other generation capacity, how you can size up your battery and sort of take that first step to getting the battery that you need for your business. Okay, awesome. I'll be in touch. Great. <laughs> oh, I love when connections are made. Awesome. Um, two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, Stephen has to leave us at um, 55. So um, there's a question from, from Francois. Um, who's asking um, the, the big question that is on, everyone, on everyone's mind. Um, what sort of returns are you seeing in your uh, industry? It's a big complex question, but can you share with us what you're seeing? Um, okay, perhaps I could start with that one, Dave. Um, when we're talking about generation, uh, particularly new build uh, wind farms as we're doing at the moment uh, with construction risk, um, typically, what we're looking for is a 12% IRR. So that would mean, you know, a, a levered um, post-tax, post-project tax IRR of around 12%. Um, and we think that's a reasonable return given the difficulties, not only with construction, but predominantly with, with commissioning and, and connecting to the grid. You know, we've seen projects delayed, some of our own projects delayed two years uh, through that connection. Once these projects are up and running and we're seeing, you know, good contracting there with maybe a Queensland government or an ACT government um, and the projects you know, in operation, uh, we're seeing returns there about 8% um, levered IRR returns. Then if you're looking at um, some of the earlier stage stuff um, in our feeder fund, Federation Alternative Investments, we shoot for about a 15% net uh, IRR, but, you know, that's not you know, contracted offtake, you're taking, you know, you're taking risk on, on technological development or business growth and, and so forth. So 8% through to, you know, call it 17% gross, 15 net. Thanks, Stephen. For, for once, um, a clear answer, because I, <laughs> when, I, when I ask this question, it's always a bit tricky to, to answer. The, thank it you. is. <laughs> well, thanks, Camille. It is my business, though. So yeah. uh, if, I, if I couldn't answer that, um, I probably wouldn't be a great investor. No, but you know, politically, sometimes it's hard to get those kind of answers. But anyway, um, I would I would love to finish that event, it, this event um, on BatNav. So Dave um, is currently fundraising for his business. So Dave, can you give us an update on where you are at with this and uh, maybe share with the, the audience a little bit more details about that? Yeah, so uh, we started a crowdfunding campaign about two weeks ago to raise some capital to deliver our, our next product. So we've got a partnership with um, uh, Ingenuity Solutions that have been doing a lot of the, the industrial commercial batteries uh, talked about previously. So, and earlier on, we talked about Batna being sort of like a platform to scale expertise, and that's really what we do. So um, we've identified the commercial and industrial market as, as a very high growth market. And also it doesn't have the same sort of restrictions that... Um, it doesn't have the same sort of restrictions that the utility market has, as in grid connection agreements are, are much shorter, much simpler, and there's a, a, a definite business case for them. So we're raising capital for that. We've um, got 140 investors so far. There, there's a small scale. So this is equity crowdfunding. So it's like a, a public offer on a private company. So we still have a number of regulatory things that as a company we need to adhere to, which is the right thing to do. And uh, we've raised nearly $220,000. It closes tomorrow. Um, virtual.com is the platform and I think Camille will send out a link to it uh, later on um, so people can find that a lot easier but if you if you're interested please jump on we have a full offer document there it's 40 plus 
uh, page document with all our financial statements and disclosures about risks and everything about me and the team, um, our advisory board who are very, very experienced and, you know, um, the chairman of Gen X Power is our, the chair of our advisory board. So we've got people on board that really know the industry and have a really good inside knowledge of the industry. Um, and then we also have an, have an awesome team and we've shown that we can deliver. So if you're interested in investing in um, a company that's focused on the energy transition and helping energy storage um, reach its market, then please take a look. Thank you. Um, Stephen, I'm conscious you have to go so feel free to head off while we wrap up um, yes. thank you so much for your insights I uh, really appreciate your time uh, I will be sending an email with a link to Federation if uh, people want to get in touch with you and continue the conversation um, thank you so much uh, Camille and uh, Dr West and, and the audience I've, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation I do know that there are a couple of questions there uh, Camille Francois has has uh, another one. I'm happy to answer those questions if you forward them to me um, uh, after this. That sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you um, all. Have a good day. And uh, Dave, um, sorry, quickly coming back to you. We've got five more minutes, so um, stay with us. I've, um, I have shared the virtual link um, to your um, fundraising campaign in the chat, but I will also share it in the email. Congratulations for um, the amount you raised so far, and uh, I hope you will have a really strong um, close um, today and, and good, good support. So um, everyone, I would really encourage you to have a, a look at um, the pack that is available on virtual, it's really complete um, and all the information is there. So with that in mind, um, I will wrap up the event for today. Unless Dave, you have some final remarks or things you'd love to share? No, I think you're doing a great job, Camille. Okay. You're, awesome. you're such a pleasant facilitator. This is the second webinar I've been on and, and you do a really great job. So keep oh, doing what you're doing. Thank you. thank you so much. I love these um, very selfishly. I'm learning a lot. So yeah. um, Pleasure. Um, I will simply wrap up by thanking everyone for coming today to learn. Um, I think we can agree that our speakers were really, really knowledgeable. So it's um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I would love to invite you all to our next event, uh, which will be um, on the 14th of July. We'll talk about how to use your money as a force for good. And I have a really special um, guest for this event from Market Forces. I don't know if you heard of them, but they are a leading organization that really dive deep into what um, sustainable banking is about. And they keep all their banks, superannuation funds accountable on their climate action. They are doing a fantastic job. So please join us. On the 14th of July, it will be um, a really interesting conversation. And otherwise, um, again, thank you so much for joining and, uh, and learning with us. Our group is now 930 members strong, which is crazy and so good to see. But um, I would love your help to grow this community even further. So if you enjoyed today, please invite your friends and colleagues um, who might also find this conversation useful. And please reach out if you have um, topics or if you would love to put your hand up as a speaker, um, please reach out. Um, I will send everyone an email after this event with the recording and, and the notes. So you simply reply to that, to that email. That is it for today. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you, everyone. I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.